All right, well, if you uh, are, are not familiar, um, Randy is on vacation, and uh, I'm starting this morning. We're back to studying Israelology, which is a uh, doctrinal study on Israel from its uh, very beginning, when it was created, all the way to its consummation, to its end. And uh, as, as we go along, you'll see kind of, kind of how we go uh, in this section. When we look in Ezekiel chapter 5 and verse 5, we see this phrase used here, speaking of Israel, this is Jerusalem, I've set her in the center of the nations with countries all around her. When, when we're talking about Israelology, um, I don't know how, how else to say it, the consummation of all Judaism is Christ. He fulfills all that Judaism is. And all that Christianity is. Um, God has set Israel in the center of the nations. If you look uh, where it's at on the dividing of the continents, you have Europe, Africa, and Asia. Any trade route had to go through Israel. Now, you may say, well, I don't know, how, how big is Israel? Israel's probably a pretty large place to, to be. It's probably kind of hard. Well, in relationship to the United States, that's Israel. That's the nation of Israel, the nation that you hear of all the time and that you see all the time on the news. It's no bigger than Rhode Island. That's the nation of Israel. And so that's what we're going to look at this morning, the nation of Israel, um, how God has chosen her and ordained her, how God has set his name in her. Listen to 2 Kings chapter 21 and verse 13. Seven, he even set a carved image of Ashereth, which he had made in the house which the Lord or Yahweh had said to David and to Solomon his son, in this house and in Jerusalem, which I have chosen out of all the tribes of Israel, I will put my name forever. I will put my name forever. Psalm 132 verses 13 and 14, and these are just a few verses to give you sort of an insight into God's viewpoint of the nation of Israel. For the Lord has chosen Zion. He has desired it for his dwelling place. This is my resting place forever. Here I will dwell, for I have desired it. I will abundantly bless her provision, and I will satisfy her poor with bread. Again, in verse 14, this is my resting place Forever, here I will dwell, for I have desired it. God has created, he has chosen, as we have seen and, and as we will see in our outline. God has created, God has chosen and called, God has covenanted himself to Israel alone. Now, some, put, some say that, Israel has been replaced with the church, and there is no future chastening. There is no future conversion, and we are now in the Messianic kingdom. That's what some people say today and who contend that the Israel of God is all believers. For example, let me give you just a couple of references. People that you may know, may be familiar with, and I, by the way, I don't have any problems with these people. Um, I like them. I appreciate them. But I just want you to understand what the thinking is of a lot of teachers today. So speaking of Israel, John Piper says this, God has a saving purpose for Israel. All Israel will someday turn to the Lord Christ as a group. This is my deep understanding in the belief of Romans 11 the broken off branches, which are the Jews, will be grafted in one day to the people of God, the bride of Christ, his church. In other words, the consummation for Israel is to be grafted in to the church. The church replaces Israel. Do you see that? Now, that's not as clear. You have to really be thinking about what he says. But there are others who are even more clear concerning what we're talking about here. And I don't know if you know any of these people, but um, I thought I would try to pick out some people that you may know. Kenneth, Kenneth Gentry Jr., who is very dominant in this view, says this. That is, we believe 
in the unfolding plan of God in history. The Christian church is the very fruition of the redemptive purpose of God. As such, the multiracial International Church of Jesus Christ supersedes racial national Israel as the focus of the kingdom of God. Indeed, we believe that the church becomes the Israel of God. In other words, there is no future chastening for Israel, no 70th week, no tribulational period. There is no, there is no uh, war with Russia and her allied forces. There is no... There is no uh, Time delay in the gap between the uh, tribulation and the millennial kingdom. There is no literal millennial kingdom that's even now, today. So he believes that the Israel of God is all believers. And then let me give you just one more. Again, a very favorite of mine and yours too, uh, Dr. R.C. Sproul. We believe that the church is essentially Israel. We believe that the answer to what about the Jews is, here we are. We are all together the Israel of God, princes with God and the ecclesia or the church, the set apart ones. That's from Dr. R.C. Sproul. Now, we'll get into that uh, subject at the very end of our discussion when we start talking about the contenders, that is those who teach that the church has replaced Israel and the church is the new Israel. We'll get into that. But just for the sake of your understanding, I did want to give you some things to kind of uh, set your mind where it needs to be. If we're looking at our English translations, and you, and you understand there are various translations. I, I, I know you understand that. There are some that are literal translations. There are some that are paraphrased translations. And there are some that are just um, sort of off-the-cuff translations. Um, you want to go, when you're teaching doctrine, to an essentially literal translation, the ESV, the New King James, King James, the NASB, one of those. You don't want to go to uh, the NLT, to the NIV, to one of those, because they use a lot of their own terminology, and they don't translate the literal wording. And I'll show you that when we get to the subject. But this is just out of the NASB. This will probably read totally different if you have the NIV. If you're reading from the NIV, you'll see one group there. But if you look at the literalness of this translation, you'll see there are not one group. There's two groups there. Uh, if you look at Galatians 6.16, and those who will walk by this rule, peace and mercy be epi upon them and epi upon the Israel of God. Two distinct groups there, not just one. Now you say, well, does Paul talk that way all the time? Does he ever use... Two people in the same verse. Look at uh, Galatians chapter 6 and notice, if you will, verse 15. Galatians chapter 6 and verse 15. And I would like you to turn there, or at least act like you're turning, maybe rustle your pages or something like that. Sometimes it's a little bit difficult if uh, you're looking on a computer or looking on your phone and you don't hear the pages rustling. You're wondering if anybody's really paying attention or following you. But Galatians chapter 6 and verse 15, this is the verse right before this. Notice how many people are described in this verse if you have not already. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but a new creation. How many people are in that verse? Anybody want to guess? There's the circumcised, which are who? The Jews, there are the uncircumcised, which are who? The Gentiles. And there is the new creation. Behold, if any man's in Christ, he is a new creation. How many groups are there? Three groups. You see that? Three groups. And so all I'm saying to you is be careful how you read and what you read. Now, to kind of stair step you back up to where we are. We are starting, we will start actually, in the covenant structure, and we will start under the Abrahamic covenant when we get there, but I want to stair-step you up to that covenant, um, that covenant area. And so first I want, to understand, I want you to understand the context of Israel. Remember from Genesis 1 to 11, there is no Israel. You understand that, right? There's no Israel there. 
But there is something there that is going on. Uh, if you look in your Bible to, oh, let's say, look at Jeremiah chapter 44. That's somewhat of a familiar passage. We could go to several places. We could go to Ezekiel 8. We could go to Ezekiel 7. But if you go to uh, Ezekiel 44, I don't know if this will work. Let me see if it will. Jeremiah chapter 44. There we go. Jeremiah chapter 44. Now, if you're looking at this, you'll see what's going on here. He says in verse 13, I will punish those who dwell in the land of Egypt as I punish Jerusalem. And here are the here are the judgment signs that God uses sword, famine and pestilence. You see that there that he talks about in uh, verse 13. You'll see that same thing in Ezekiel chapter 14, verse 21 where God says, these are my furious judgments that will come upon Israel. And we see this all throughout the scripture, that these are God's punishments that come upon Israel. But God says, then all the men who knew their wives and burned incense to other gods with the other women who stood by, a great multitude and all people who dwelt in the land of Egypt in Pathos answered Jeremiah saying, and the, the point that I want you to see is the other gods they're sacrificing to you come down to verse 17 but we will certainly do whatever's gone out of our mouth to burn incense to the queen of heaven verse 18 but since we stopped burning incense to the queen of heaven uh, we've liked nothing but we've been consumed by sword and famine and pestilence verse 19 the woman said also and when we burned incense to the queen of heaven and poured out drink offerings to her uh, did we make cakes for her to worship her. Now, if you type in that phrase in your computer, the queen of heaven, and you push search, what will come up? Anybody know? Mary, the queen of heaven. Mary is known by the Catholic Church as the queen of heaven. And anything that gets done through Christ has to be gone through the mother. And that's how they teach it. You go through the mother to the son to get what you need. And so you see that the queen of heaven there is spoken of. And that was the context in which um, Israel, before Israel was created, that's the context in which they were. This is a cult worship. Uh, If you look back at Genesis chapter 10, just so I can remind you of this. And by the way, this is history. This is reality. This isn't a myth. It's not a fable. It's not a story. This is history. Your Bible is a history book. Notice in chapter 10, there of Hebrews, just verses 6 through 9, to give you the setting there. uh, Verse 5 says, From these, the coastland peoples of the Gentiles were separated into their lands, everyone according to their language, according to their families, into their nations. The sons of Ham were Cush, Mizraim, Put, and Canaan. The sons of Cush were Seba, Havilah, Sabbath, Ramah, Sabika, and the sons of Ramah were Sheba and Dedan. Cush begat Nimrod, and he became he began to be a mighty one on the earth. The word mighty one there is Gabor. It means a, a, uh, a fierce or powerful or mighty hunter. If you look back in chapter 6 of Genesis in verse 4, there's an example of this given, one of many examples. But there were giants on the earth in those days, and also afterward, when the sons of God came in to the daughters of men, and they bore children to them, those were the Gibor, the mighty men who were of old, men of renown. You'll see the same thing in Deuteronomy and Samuel and in Proverbs chapter 30. So Nimrod here is said to be a mighty man, a mighty hunter on the earth. Verse 9, he was a mighty hunter before Yahweh, therefore it is said, like Nimrod, the mighty hunter before Yahweh. And now watch this, because this is important, and you're going to see this theme run all throughout Scripture if you're not aware of it. In the beginning, his kingdom was what? Babel. Now you say, what does Babel mean? Well, look at chapter 11 and verse 9. Therefore, its name is called Babel, because there the Lord confused their language. That's what Babel means. The kingdom, of, the kingdom of confusion. That's what Babel is. And you will see Babylon run from Genesis all the way to the book of the Revelation. 
right? So you'll see that there. And so you see this mother cult worship, which started with Nimrod's wife, Semiramis, and with their son, Tamas. Now, if you're not familiar with those names, I think maybe Ezekiel mentions them in Ezekiel chapter 8 and verse 14. So let me read that for you, see if that's, uh, see if that's correct. And he brought me to the door of the north gate to Yahweh's house. And to my dismay, women were sitting there weeping for Tamas, which is with the son of Nimrod and Semiramis. And supposedly what had happened, Tamas is killed, resurrected. People began worshiping him and sacrificing things to him. It's that context in chapter 11. Remember, chapter 10, then chapter 11, chapter 11, what, what event, what historical event is going on in chapter 11 of Genesis? Help me out now. What happens in Genesis chapter 11? Anybody want to guess? The whole earth, they're of one language and one speech in verse 1. They go to the land of Shinar and dwell there. Verse 4, they come and they say, Let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth, which is what they were supposed to do. Verse 9, therefore, its name is called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth, and from there Yahweh scattered them abroad over all the face of the earth. God told them they were to do that. They would not do that. They said, let's make a, a tower, a name for ourselves, the gate of God. And God came down and God confused their language and spread them throughout. But in spreading them throughout, they're going throughout the world with this mother-son worship. And we'll see that when we get to that. And I'll show you the outlines of how you can see that throughout history. But you'll see that. So that's the cult and that's the context in which they're created. Right? Next, I want you to notice their creation. Look at Isaiah 43. Isaiah chapter 43. Isaiah chapter 43, and notice, if you will, verse, verses 1 and 7 here. Isaiah 43, verses 1 and 7. But now thus saith Yahweh, who created you, O Jacob, and who formed you, O Israel. Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by your name. You are mine. You are mine. Verse 7. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I have created for my glory, I have formed him. Yes, I have made him. I have created for my glory. I have formed him. Yes, I have made him. The Lord who created you. Bara is the word there in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1. You can see that very thing. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Bara. He created it. You can see the same thing in verse 27 of that first chapter. Just to give you a couple references to Mark. So God created man in his image. Verse, 20, verse 27 of chapter 1. So the Lord created you, O Jacob, and he formed you, Yatzer. It literally means to squeeze something into shape. If, if you look in Genesis 2-7, you see the same thing. The Lord God formed man uh, of the dust of the ground. So God squeezed him into that shape. You see the same thing in Zechariah, which is a very interesting verse. Zechariah chapter 12 and verse 1. I want you to turn there, if you will, or just mark it down. Zechariah chapter 12 and verse 1, the Bible says this, The burden of the word of Yahweh against Israel, thus saith Yahweh, who stretches out the heavens, lays the foundation of the earth, and forms the spirit of man within him. And forms the spirit of man within him, or creates or molds that spirit of man within him. So God creates Israel for his glory, according to verse 7, through a pagan by the name of... Anybody want to guess? Abram, who was a Gentile, but who becomes the father of the Jews. Look at Joshua chapter 24. And by the way, if, if you're unfamiliar with any of these things, um, I hope that uh, 
This will help you to remember them. Joshua chapter 24, verses 2 and 3. Joshua said to all the people, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, the Yahweh, God of Israel, your fathers, including the father of Abraham, the father of Nahor, dwelt on the other side of the river in old times and served other gods. You see that? They served other gods. They were pagan. Uh, You can see that God calls Abraham out when he is even before Haran. Um, If you recall, Stephen in the book of Acts chapter 7 begins with this discussion. In Acts chapter 7 verses 2 and 3, he says this, and he said, Brethren and fathers, listen, the God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia, between the rivers. This is before he goes up. And before he sets out on his travel. And he does all this, we know, by faith. Uh, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 8. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called out to a place which he would receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. Not knowing where he was going. So God creates uh, Israel. He shapes them for his glory. And he chooses them to be his covenant people through Abraham. Now, maybe you're not familiar with the verses that talk about Abraham being their forefather, but just a couple of verses for you to think about. Matthew chapter 3 and Luke chapter 3 both uh, speak of this. In Matthew chapter 3 and verse 9, it speaks of this passage this way. And do not think to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. We have Abraham as our father. Luke chapter 3 says the same thing. In Luke chapter 3 and verse 8 this time. Therefore bear fruits worthy of repentance and do not begin to say to yourself, we have Abraham as our father. So not only does Matthew say it, not only does Luke say it, but John says the same thing. So you have three different uh, witnesses here. John chapter 8 and I think it's verse 39. They answered and said uh, to him, Abraham is our father. Abraham is our father. And so we see that God, um, in the context of idolatry, chooses to create and form Israel. He calls them out. (coughs) Excuse me. He he creates them uh, for his glory. And then notice the third point. He chooses them out of all the nations of the earth. Now, I know a lot of people don't like this discussion because this seems very Israel-centered. But your Bible is very Israel-centered. By the way, in the Old Testament, salvation is promised one day to the Gentiles. But during the context of the time we're talking, salvation is not being broadened and, and being preached to the, to the nations. Do you understand that? Salvation is not being given. Um, I don't know if you know this. You probably do. But Mark chapter 9, verses 31 and 32 And then Luke 18 tells you the same thing, and there are other places as well. But in Luke chapter 9, yeah, Luke chapter 9, verses 31 and 32. Now, I want you to see this. This is the day when Jesus is is, uh, during his ministry, the days when he is during his ministry. The disciples are with him. The disciples, if anybody, should know the gospel. They should know what's going on. They know the death, burial, and resurrection, right? That is the gospel, In case you're wondering, let me read that for you in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the first several verses, and I want you to see this. Maybe you are not aware of this, but notice what, or listen to what Paul says in verse 1 of 1 Corinthians 15, moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received, and in which you stand, by which you are saved, if you hold fast the word which I preached unto you, unless you believed in vain or without success. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scripture. He was buried, and he rose the third day, according to Scriptures. Now, what did he just give them? What did he just give them? He said Christ died for, the, for our sins according to the Scripture. He was buried, and he rose again the third day according to the, to the Scriptures. By the way, he's quoting from the Old Testament. So he's saying in the Old Testament, you know that Christ 
The Old Testament teaches Christ would come, that he would die, and that he would raise again the third day. What did he just tell them? The gospel. Now, that's pretty easy, right? We all understand that. But when you go and you look at Jesus' disciples, they didn't get it. You say, what do you mean? Well, look at Mark chapter 9, verses 31 and 2. For he taught his disciples and said to them, The Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of men. They will kill him, and after he is killed, he will rise the third day. What did he just tell them? What did he just tell them? The gospel. Notice verse 32. They did not understand this saying and were afraid to ask him. They didn't get it. Luke 18 tells you the same thing. They were afraid to ask him what he was talking about. You see that? So they did not know. So what we're looking at here is the choosing of Israel. God is going to now choose Israel. You can see this way back in Exodus chapter 19 and verse 5. Exodus 19 and verse 5. Now therefore... If you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all, the, the, uh, above all people, for all the earth is mine. You will be a special treasure to me. You see that? God calls the nation of Israel his sigula, his, his treasure, his stored up, hidden jewel. I don't know if any of you have jewels. Maybe you, some of you women have jewels or some of you men may have jewels, but how many of you have jewels that you keep locked up? They're a precious treasure to you. Maybe you've gotten them from uh, someone who lived before you. But God said concerning himself that Israel is his stored up treasure. And yet there are people today who say God has dismissed Israel. God does not want Israel. God is not doing anything with Israel. And therefore, he is doing everything in, uh, that he does in and through the church. The problem is, when you're looking at the new covenant and you see what he says afterward, you see that that's not true at all. This is what the Lord says, if heaven's above, if heaven's above can be measured and the foundations of the earth searched out, that is, if you can do that, then I will also reject the descendants of Israel for everything they have done, declares the Lord. God says, I will never reject Israel. They're my special treasure. They are my chosen people, you see. And so that is how God views them. He chose them, brought them out unto himself to be a special people. L listen to Deuteronomy. I'll give you just a few verses to think about concerning this. Deuteronomy chapter 7 and verse 6, for you are a holy people unto Yahweh your God, and Yahweh your God has chosen you to be a people for himself, a special treasure above all the peoples on the face of the earth, above the Americans. I know you don't like that, do you? But he says, you, Israel, are a special jewel, a treasure unto me above all the world. There's no one in the world that is a special treasure to me like you are. So what about Israel? Is there a future for Israel? Listen to Psalm 135 in verse 4. And again, he uses this phrase over and over again throughout the Scripture, and it's never of the Gentiles. It is always of his people, the Jews. Psalm 135 and verse 4, For Yahweh has chosen, there it is again, he has chosen Jacob for himself, Israel for his special treasure you see that israel he has chosen for his special treasure and then malachi 3 verse 17 talks about the redeemed that remnant being his special treasure but he chose them to be his witnesses not only are they his special treasure but they are his witnesses listen to uh, isaiah chapter 43 and verse 1 Isaiah chapter 43 and Isaiah chapter 44, just a couple passages there. Isaiah 43, verses 10 and then 12, and then you can see in chapter uh, 44 and verse 8, uh, this phrase again. But in chapter 43, verse 10, God says this, You are my witnesses, 
says Yahweh, my servant whom I have chosen. Verse 12, uh, I've declared and saved and proclaimed, and there was no foreign God among you. Therefore, you are my witnesses, says Yahweh, that I am God. So God chooses Israel to be his people. Um, he is the, they are the people uh, of his earth. You can see that back in chapter 41, verses 8 and 9. And notice this passage, if you will, chapter 41, verses 8 and 9. But you, Israel, are my servant, Jacob, whom I've chosen, the descendants of Abraham, my friend. You I have taken from the ends of the earth and called from its farthest regions and said to you, you are my servant. I have chosen you and have not cast you away. God said, I've chosen you. You are my special people. You are my witnesses. And it does not matter what anyone else says, regardless of anything you do, I have chosen you. And this is the, the standing today. This little nation that we consider, that we call Israel, uh, that's just as big as Rhode Island, God has chosen to set his name there and will set his name there uh, even in the future, right? The testimony, the, the, the ark was to serve, or the, the book that was put in the ark was to serve as a witness as well. Um, Deuteronomy 31 talks about that. And I wasn't going to mention it, but I, I do need to, to mention this. Deuteronomy 31, verse 26. This is the book of the law, and I put it beside the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God, that it may be there as a witness against you. Right? So the book of the law was given as a witness against them. And because God's chosen them from before time began uh, to be his treasured people, he calls them unto himself to be his special witnesses. Now, just to give you a, a sort of an inkling of where we come in, remember, in this context, during this time, God is not proclaiming the, the gospel to the world. I don't know if you're familiar with the difference between the Old and the New Testament, but in the Old Testament, God, God's people were stationary. They sat in a certain place, and they had certain things that they ate, certain dresses that they, they or certain clothes that they wore, certain rituals that they performed, and the message was not go and proclaim the gospel because people didn't get the gospel. Not even the disciples got the gospel. It wasn't go and see. It was you, the world, the Gentiles, you come and see. Come and see what God is doing in and through us. That was the Old Testament message. The New Testament message was now go and proclaim the gospel because Yeshua has come, because Jesus has come. You see that? But in Ephesians chapter 1, just to give you an inkling uh, of, of uh, Gentile salvation, you can see this in, Gal in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse uh, 4. There are many other verses. But notice what he says in verse 4. Just as he has chosen us in Christ before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. God in eternity past has chosen you and I out to be his witnesses, Acts 1-8, in the future. But that does not mean that he has replaced Israel with what we're doing. As a matter of fact, who, who in here can tell me just to see where you are and how well you understand this. Who in here can tell me why the church exists today? Who in here can tell me one of the reasons why you and I, the church, exists today? Hey, hang on just a minute. He's right behind you. The man with the mic. Perhaps to make Israel jealous. Perhaps to make Israel jealous. Well, how would that make Israel jealous? And God dealing with the Gentiles now, how would that make them jealous? Well, when the time comes and the Spirit moves across His people in Israel, then I think they will look across then recent history and realize that there is a passion here in the church for their Redeemer. And they will identify Christ as their Messiah because of our faithfulness to know Him as our Redeemer. All right. Anybody else? I think of Paul's words in Romans uh, chapter 9 when he says, uh, 
in uh, verse 4. They are the Israelites, and to them belong adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. To them, to them belong the patriarchs, and from their race, according to flesh, is the Christ, who is God over all. Blessed forever. Amen. What were you... What was your thinking on reading that? Because to them, that's originally, you know, God did choose them. To them, it belonged. That, that was their, that was, that was the Israel. And how did they view the Samaritans and the Gentiles and everybody else? They, it didn't belong to them. <laughs> it wasn't theirs. It, you, it originally was, belonged to them. Yes. Do you understand that? Salvation was not proclaimed to all the Gentiles. As a matter of fact, millions were killed. I don't know if you understand that, but even in Genesis 6, when the flood comes, there were millions that were killed. Only eight were saved. That's beside all the others who had died, you see. And listen to, and you had mentioned uh, the book of Romans. Let me give you two verses for you to think of and remember. Uh, Romans 10, 19, and Romans uh, chapter 11, and verse 11. I'm going to give you those two verses so that you can Know those, write those down, study those, think about those. But in Romans chapter 10, uh, verse 19, But I say, did Israel not know? First Moses says, now watch this, I will provoke you to jealousy by a nation who are not a nation, and I will move you to anger by a foolish nation. He's talking about the Gentiles. He's quoting from Deuteronomy here. Chapter 11, verse 11, I say they have stumbled that they, should, that they should fall. I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? Certainly not. But through their fall, to provoke them to what? Jealousy. To provoke them to jealousy, salvation has come to the Gentiles. You see that? God right now, during this time, historically, is using you and I to provoke Israel to jealousy, that they might yearn for the relationship that they were promised to have and only they were promised to have. That's what he had read in Luke 9, and I don't know if you caught what he had said there in those verses, but if you look in verses 4 and 5, just in verse 4, who are Israelites? To whom pertains the adoption, the glory, and the covenants? They're the covenant people. God did not covenant with the Gentiles. He covenanted with the Jews, his sigula, his witnesses, right? Any other thoughts so far on this? Now, I'm laying this down, and we'll lay it down again, but people don't understand the Old Testament. They don't understand the foundation of their faith. You have to understand this because when we're looking at this, Israel's history is not over. I mean, there is no end to it. All God is doing when we get to the covenant structure is he is working out all of these situations. He has already created them in the, in the context they were in. He has chosen them. He's going to call them. We looked at the covenants, which follows with their literal chastening, their conversion, their kingdom, and then those who contend that they don't even exist. Now, here's something for you to think about. What do you do with those who contend they don't even exist? You have to do something with that. You have to do something with that belief system, because if that's false, then the whole system is false, and that's just for you to work out on your own. But notice also that he calls them. He not only creates them in a context, he not only chooses them above all the families of the earth, but he also calls them specifically unto himself. Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse 34 Deuteronomy 4, verse 34, and notice this is very important of what he says here. Did God ever try to go and take for himself a nation from the midst of another nation? Has he ever done that? Has God ever went into another nation and tried to pull from that nation a separate nation? Yeah, he has. By trials, by signs, by wonders, by war, by a mighty hand, an outstretched arm, by great terrors, according to all that Yahweh your God did for you in Egypt before your eyes. To you it was shown that you might know that Yahweh himself is God and there is none other besides him. 
You see that? God chose Israel out from Egypt and called them unto himself as a new nation, as his sigkula, his special treasure, his witnesses uh, to be separate from this idolatrous um, mother-son worship, which we'll look at and I'll show you charts of that has permeated every other culture, and you'll see that. Amos chapter 3 and verse 2 uh, is another passage that you may or may not be familiar, uh, familiar with. Amos chapter 3, and notice the beginning in verse 1. Hear this word that Yahweh has spoken to you, O children of Israel, against the whole family which I brought up from the land of Israel, saying, You only have I known of all the families of the earth. Therefore, because of that, I will punish you for your iniquities. You only have I known of all the people of the earth. And by the way, this calling is all of grace. If you're, if you're not familiar with that, let me give you one, one verse that really I think, uh, well, <laughs> there's several verses, but let, go to Deuteronomy or just listen to Deuteronomy. This is God's choosing uh, of Israel and, and what he says about them. Um, well, even, even before that, I think in, in the book of Exodus, he says something in chapter uh, 32 and verse 9. Yeah, Exodus 32, 9. And Yahweh said to Moses, and he's talking about Israel, I have seen this people, this people that I created, this people I've chosen, this people I've called, and indeed it is a what? How does he refer to them? A stiff-necked people. That's, a, that's an unusual phrase, isn't it? A stiff-necked people. What's your thoughts when you hear that phrase? Just think about that for a minute. A stiff-necked people. Is that a positive phrase? Because he uses that over and over again. In Deuteronomy 33 and, and Deuteronomy 10, or Exodus 33, Deuteronomy 10 and 31, and Jeremiah 7, 26, he uses that over and over and over again to talk about his people. But listen to what he says in Deuteronomy chapter uh, 9, verses 4 through 6. And this is very, I mean, this is really, this should really set you where you belong. Do not think in your heart after Yahweh your God has cast them out before you. Speaking of the pagans, he's going to cast them out of the land, saying, Because of my righteousness, Yahweh has brought me in to possess this land. But it is because of the wickedness of these nations that Yahweh is driving them out before you. It's not your righteousness. It's not your righteousness at all. Matter of fact, the reason they're going out is because of their wickedness. You got it all wrong. But you see what had developed in their mindset already? We are the chosen, us alone. No Gentiles, no Samaritans, just us, the Jews. And verse 5, it is not because of your righteousness. Again, he tells them it's not because of your righteousness or the uprightness of your heart that, I, that you go in to possess their land, but because of the wickedness of these nations that the Lord, that Yahweh your God drives them out before you and that he may fulfill the word which Yahweh swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now watch this, verse 6. Therefore understand that Yahweh your God is not giving you this good land to possess because of your, because of your righteousness, for you are a stiff-necked people. That's what he says. This call is all of grace. They didn't deserve this call at all. But God says, because of your obstinate and rebellion, uh, rebellious heart, I'm calling you anyway. Even though you're a rebel against me, I'm calling you. It's a call of grace. And that's what we see here uh, with, with Abraham, with these people being called. It's all a call of grace. See that? Hang on just a minute, Matt. And uh, Brian, will you pass that mic over to Matt there? Push the button up. If you get the mic, uh, push the button up and it'll turn it on. Okay. This remind, uh, I was just thinking when you were talking what Jesus said uh, to the Canaanite woman in Matthew uh, 15, where uh, um, she was coming to have her uh, child healed. 
And he answered, um, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But then she came and knelt before him saying, Lord, help me. And he answered, it is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. And she said, yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumb that fall from the master's table. Then, and then Jesus answered, um, O woman, great is your faith. Be it done for you as you desire. Just the thought of, you know, modern thought would be like, why would Jesus ever call anyone a dog? You know, it's just, <laughs> and it's just funny, but um, it fits, it aligns very much with this topic, right? And you're talking and uh, anyways, it just made me think of that. And, uh, and it goes, uh, anyways, this is aligns with this. So I just thought it was just a good thing to bring up that is even in the, through the teaching of Jesus, right? It, this isn't new, like you were saying, so. This is, yeah, this is not new. Remember, that's, no one thought of the Gentiles or Samaritans as being recipients of salvation, right? Think about the Gentile salvation, your salvation. First uh, Corinthians chapter 1, for you see, and note, he, he mentions calling in verse 26 twice, twice in verse uh, 27, and once in verse 28. For you see your calling, brethren, not many are wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. He's chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things that are mighty. And the base things of the world and the things which are despised, God has chosen. And things which are not to bring to nothing things that are. Why? That no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him you are in Christ, who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that as it is written in Jeremiah 9, 24, he who glories, let him glory in the Lord. You have no right to salvation. No one in here has a right to salvation. There's nothing in here any of us can say or do that would ascribe God's saving grace to us. It's of grace. And in the beginning, back when we're reading, it wasn't even that. You didn't get that. You got nothing. You were cut off. You were aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, Ephesians 2 says. You were outside of that. But God, because of the new covenant, has adopted you into his family and given you the righteousness of Christ. The perfect life that Christ lived, the He was holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners. And the righteous death that he died to pay uh, for our sin on the cross, that was attributed to you. His passive and obedient uh, sacrifice was given to you because of your faith in him. And by that, you're saved. You're delivered. Delivered from the wrath of God eternally. And that goes back to the covenant. And if you don't understand the covenant, you won't understand salvation. Because in the Abrahamic covenant is land, seed, and blessing, and blessing is the new covenant promise, and that's what you got, and that's what we didn't deserve. You understand that? So when we go out this morning, and we're worshiping, and we're praying, or we leave and we go to work, or we leave and we go to the store, or we leave and go on vacation or at home, we are in relationship with God, all of his grace. And we didn't deserve it. Now, how does that make you feel? It should humble you, in case you didn't know. (laughs) It should bring humility to you. So that when we go out into the sanctuary and when we begin to worship the Lord, we can be at awe of who he is and what he's done. And the fact that we didn't deserve that salvation that we have. We're a new creation in Christ, right? Uh, Next week, we would just want to go over briefly the the covenants that we've already looked at, which is the Noahic covenant. And if you look at the Noahic covenant, which I put up here, what you can see is this is a very big deal, this Noahic covenant. If you look at the context of his day, uh, satanically and socially and spiritually, and you see his character, I mean, you can see a lot of that today. By the way, Jesus said, just as it was in the days of Noah, so will it be again at the end. And you can see those same characteristics now and again today.